I will add one announcement to uh, Frank's list that was given to me before I came down this morning. And that is a reminder to all those uh, leaders who are working in Awanas that this Saturday uh, from 8.30 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon is the Awana Conference, the Fall Awana Conference at Bethel Bible Chapel. And it's, they're asking $6 a person or $9 a couple um, since they will be providing lunch. Right? So uh, please uh, specifically tell me uh, today or sometime in the next couple of days because I have to call John Lidstone back at Bethel Bible Chapel by Wednesday with the final head count so they know how much food to prepare. Okay? We'd like to have all of the Awana leaders there if possible. Please turn with me in your Bibles this morning to James. That is at the end of the New Testament. Have you noticed that people around you at school or at work or out in public don't talk about sin anymore? Sin is a non-word in the English language today. A writer for Newsweek magazine noted recently that where the concept of wrong is really important as a guide to one's own behavior or that of one's own side in some dispute, it is missing. And he lists a number of words that uh, our society has used to substitute for the word sin. So instead of something being sinful, it's stupid or not necessarily unconstitutional or sick or something is only to be expected or instead of being wrong, it's complex. And uh, he concludes, and this was a secular writer, concludes by saying that our real problem is this. The still small voice of our conscience has become far too small and utterly still. Now, that's a secular writer writing about his society, our society, not from a moralistic point of view, not as a preacher would preach from the front uh, of a church gathering like this, but he's making a, an observation on his society that there is no such thing today as sin in the, in the popular mind. It's unfortunate that I think many of us as God's children have become a little lax ourselves. And I have been greatly stimulated in my own mind to study holiness and uh, right living. The book of James is one of the shorter books in the New Testament, and yet he has at least 11 specific references to this matter of living right or being holy. I think some of them are very practical. This morning, Sid in Sunday school, an adult Sunday school here at the chapel, spoke on David's sin with Bathsheba and uh, murdering her husband and how God... Uh, sent consequences into his life. And nevertheless, even in the midst of all those very difficult things, showed his grace. Well, I think we could say amen to that in each of our own lives. Those of us this morning that know the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior, if we really knew what kind of a God we were dealing with, we'd... Uh, we'd be very thankful for His grace in our lives. We would believe in grace because we're still here. <laughs> we would believe in grace because we're still here. Who was James? James was... Well, it depends on who you're talking about. There are three or four individuals in the Bible who are called James. The man that wrote this book that we're looking at this morning calls himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people think that this was James, the son of Alphaeus, one of the apostles, one of the twelve disciples that followed Jesus around for three and a half years. We know it wasn't James the less because he was put to death by Herod 
And Herod tried to do the same thing to Peter, one of the other apostles. So it's not him. There's another James in the New Testament, and that's James, the brother of Jesus. It turns out that James, the son of Alphaeus, was Jesus' cousin. And it also turns out that James, the son of Joseph and Mary, was also Je was Jesus' half-brother. So this book is either written by a cousin or a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. How would you like having a sister or a brother that never did anything wrong? Now, none of us is in that position this morning. Um, however, sometimes we, because we blow it, uh, we begin to feel as if uh, they're trying to put one over on us. Can you imagine living with a person that uh, never irritated his parents, that always did exactly like mom and dad said, that uh, never did anything wrong or even foolish? It was always perfect. Can you imagine living with a person like that? Well, I would suspect that uh, like Jesus' brothers and sisters, that we would probably become very super sensitive to this person, this uh, uppity-up snob sort of person. And uh, we would begin to attribute to this person uh, wrongs that we create in our own thinking. That's quite normal, isn't it? Think of the story in the Old Testament of Joseph and his brothers and how that eventually they tried to kill him because they couldn't stand this guy any longer. He was always seen to be putting himself up above them as a standard. Well, I can see by some of your faces that you know uh, what I'm talking about. We become super sensitive. We become jealous sometimes. We become super critical of people that uh, are close to us and have the audacity to... Uh, seem that they're better than us or even to try to do right when we love to do wrong we begin impatient with them perhaps we find it confusing uh, to be around people that seem to always do right and by the way most of us or all of us this morning who are God's children should try to be like this we should try to be the kind of a person that not for the sake of making other people upset but we should try to manifest the spirit and a lifestyle that the Lord Jesus had. And if we are, we can count on it that people are going to misunderstand us. People will get angry at us. Jesus said just a night or two before he was crucified that uh, to his disciples, he said, you know, the world uh, hates me without a cause. These people hate me for no reason. I've never done anything to deserve these things. Well, Jesus was perfect and uh, tells us in the seventh chapter of the book of John in the New Testament that Jesus' own brothers and sisters couldn't stand him. They didn't believe what he had to say. Some people feel that perhaps Joseph had been married previously and uh, he had these children. Uh, I don't know if that was true or not. I, I've always thought it w that Joseph and Mary had a number of children after Jesus was born. But that makes little difference. He had brothers and sisters that couldn't stand him because he was perfect, and they, and they just completely misunderstood him. They couldn't identify with him. There was built-in conflict because he was a perfect person. He was holy, and they weren't. Well, it turns out, not very long after Jesus was crucified, that uh, at least one of his brothers, perhaps two, if not all of them, had a complete change of heart. You know what caused that? They realized that this brother of theirs, this so-called brother, was in fact God, the resurrected Lord. They had seen him with their own eyes. And they, it began, on to, began to dawn on, him, the re, the, on them that his claims that he had made and the strange behavior that he had manifested in never being like them, was something that was tied to him being actually the son of God, not merely, not, not a son of Joseph and Mary, like they were, but a son of God. James, it says, uh, was specifically singled out by the Lord Jesus after his resurrection as one of the individuals to whom Jesus would show himself 
And I'm sure that that is why James, whether or not, whether we're talking about James, the son of Alphaeus, or James, the son of Mary and Joseph, came to know the Lord Jesus. I think it was James, uh, his half-brother. And Jesus convinced his brother that, uh, that he was really the son of God after he raised from the dead. And James became a believer. In fact, James became a leader in the Jerusalem church. And many people have pointed out, for good reason, that this book that we're looking at this morning is probably the first New Testament book that was written. Probably the first New Testament book that was written. There are no references to Gentiles. There's no references to uh, Gentile Christians. Um, it's, it's completely Jewish in flavor. Everything we read about this could be true of Jews meeting together in a synagogue, Jews who had just come to know Jesus as their Messiah. And so to these kinds of people, James writes and speaks as if he was one of the Old Testament prophets speaking to the Jewish nation. And the reason I say that comes out as we work our way through these references to holiness by James. I hope this morning that you won't consider this as unimportant for you. Because we live in a society that really puts down moral absolutes. Your teachers at school, by and large, the people we rub shoulders with don't really accept for themselves the idea that there is such a thing as real right and real wrong and that someday we are all going to stand before a righteous God, our maker, who is going to judge us on the basis of his standard of right and wrong. Most people today don't believe that. And that's something that Christians have kind of waffled on a little bit. And I've been trying to impress on your minds by showing you what God's Word has to say by looking at a number of the followers of the Lord Jesus over the last few weeks as to what they said about this business of right and wrong, about holiness. And that so far we've seen that it's not an option. That for Christians, it's really an essential to realize that the way we live that is, we're supposed to live as lights in the world, really is something that's part and parcel of Jesus' teaching, of all the apostles' doctrine. It's not an incidental. God is looking over your shoulder, and He's inside your head and thinking the thoughts you think, or at least aware of the thoughts that you think. He's with you in private when you don't think anybody else is looking. He's with you when you're with your friends, and doing the things they do and talking about the things that you and your friends talk about. He's there between husbands and wives and their own secret devices and their own personal plans and the things that they value and discuss. He's with, with couples. You see, nowhere can we go that we get away from God. Well, in James chapter 1, he is talking about a very practical theme, something that we've all experienced, especially those of us who are born-again Christians, and that is the theme of temptation. The book opens with, in verse 2 this way, My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And it's difficult for us to really understand all of this, what James has to say, but he says if we'll turn to God and ask him for help that he'll help us to understand why we're having our troubles. The first thing I'd like to point out is that in verse 20 in this chapter, James makes his first reference to holiness. And it has everything to do with temptation. The wrath of man does not work the, righteous, the righteousness of God. Excuse me. I think the first point that James is making in this book has everything to do with holiness, and that is this. Holiness means having a right attitude towards God when we have problems. Let's start reading from verse 12. I'd like to read right from verse 12 to 20. Pay attention to what he says. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God 
cannot be tempted with evil, and neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth, in order that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. It's oftentimes puzzled me why, in verse 16, James would say, don't make a mistake, don't err, and then he turns around and talks about something that doesn't seem to relate at all. He talks about God in heaven giving good and perfect gifts to men. But it, those two verses have everything to do with one another, I discovered. James has been talking about trials and temptations. It's a fact of life that if you're a human being, you're going to have troubles and opportunities to fail. Every problem that we have as a Christian is something that you could consider an opportunity. It's a crossroads. And how am I going to respond? Am I going to go this way or am I going to go that way? Am I going to respond to this problem God's way or am I going to respond to it my way? And usually they're not the same. David could have easily thought, King David back in the Old Testament, he could have easily thought, this is unfair, God. You've uh, made Saul the king of this nation, and then you, then you anoint me and make me the king, but he's still on the throne, and he's chasing me around this country with a whole band of people that are armed to the teeth and trying to slit my throat. And they did it for years. And that was a trial. It was also a temptation. Of course, God wasn't trying to make David have a bad attitude about his problem. He was giving David the opportunity to grow, and David did. And David responded in faith, and he trusted God. You can think of Gideon back in the Old Testament. Many of us know the story of Gideon, how that God chose this man. His country was basically subdued by a foreign nation to the south and east of Israel. And they would come in every fall after the Israelites had worked all summer and raised their crops, and they would just go through and clean out all the granaries and burn all the standing grain and they would basically devastate the land. So getting his way up on the mountains, threshing grain, and God appears to him and said, I have a job for you, Gideon. And Gideon could have really complained to God about the fact that his country was in such turmoil and such difficulties and the fact that God would choose him, a no-account farmer, to be the leader of a renaissance and, and, and a reaction and to stand up and fight against God's enemies. Well... He didn't. His circumstances were pretty bad, and they constitute a temptation or a trial, uh, an opportunity for him to respond, and, and Gideon responded in faith. And there's all kinds of examples that you could think of in the Old Testament. But James is talking about trials and tribulations. He says, look, it, when you have a trouble, when something comes upon you that doesn't seem right or fair, well, rejoice, because God has something to do in your life. He says, blessed is the man that endures temptation, but don't figure in your trials, don't get the bad attitude that God is trying to ruin you. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Because God doesn't tempt us to do evil. He doesn't tempt men that way, but he gives us trials. He gives us difficulties to grow by, but he doesn't gives us, give us those things to make us sin. That's, that's James' point. And so James comes along and says, don't make a mistake. Literally in the Greek, stop leading yourselves astray. We tend naturally when the car, tire, when the car gets a flat tire, or when the motor blows up, or the house goes on fire, or one of our kids leaves home, or if our spouse has a fight with us and does something that we think is completely unfair and un uncalled for. When stuff like that happens to us, the first tendency, and, and, 
ask yourself if this isn't true in your own life. The first tendency is to say, how come? This isn't fair. Right? And we tend to shake our fist, as it were, in the face of God, and we complain. That's the human way to respond. Don't lead yourself astray, James says. But instead, the God who is in heaven, who gives good and perfect gifts, he's the one that is controlling the so-called gifts that come your way every day. And uh, he's begotten us to an eternal life. And so the end result of this is, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let's be swift to listen and slow to speak. Don't be charging God with being an, a despot and an ogre and a careless and an uncaring and an unfeeling individual. Let's not be shaking our hands, as it were, at God and blaming Him for the things that are happening to us. Let's be slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. If you hold your finger here, go back to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll read about this working righteousness of God. In Hebrews 11.32, the, the author who has been talking about great men and, men and women of the Christian faith says, What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, of Samson, Jephthah, David also, and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and so forth. Notice that phrase, through faith they wrought righteousness. That is the proper response. That's the holy response. If you're going to talk about holiness in practical everyday terms, what could be more practical than talking about problems that we as Christians have? And every problem is an opportunity for you to respond the right way, the holy way. It's a matter of righteousness. James says the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If you respond naturally, and a lot of Christians do this in church. They go to church and they expect to get fellowship and encouragement and edification and something blows up at church. This happens all the time. Right? So Christians tend naturally to respond to even that kind of a problem in a wrong way. They get angry. Why get angry? That's the human way. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The proper response, the holy response, is to work righteousness. Do right. In faith. Just like the men and women of God. In Hebrews chapter 11. Who through faith wrought righteousness. Did right. But it requires faith. You see... We have to trust God for our fellowship to make sure that things go right here. You have to trust God in your family, at school, in every part of your life. You have to depend on God. You have to depend on God whenever you have a problem, whenever you have a trial. That's what James is talking about. If you depend on God and then do right whatever the specific thing is, you will win. That's the proper response. You will be holy. That's what holiness is all about. Holiness isn't some uh, ethereal doctrine that's up in the fourth dimension that only mystics and great doctors of the spiritual law attain to. Holiness is something that is down to earth as your roast burning this afternoon when you get home and the house being on fire. Right? It's, it's, it has to do with problems that we all face. It's a matter of holiness. It's an issue whether I'm going to respond holily or unholily. Okay, let's leave that. In chapter 1, verses 21 to 27, at the end of this chapter, there's another way in which we can practice holiness. Let's start reading from verse 21. Wherefore, James says, put away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, is what my translation says, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, 
He is like a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and goes his way and immediately forgets what manner of man he was. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain or worthless. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. All right, a second factor. We've said We've seen in the first part of this chapter that holiness means having a right response to our problems. Here, James is telling us that holiness means practicing pure and undefiled religion. Now, those words refer to holiness. Verse 27, pure religion and undefiled. And he talks about keeping oneself unspotted. All three of those are synonyms for living a holy, righteous life. Now, what's he talking about? James is kind of like drawing two pictures for us here. He's saying that all Christians can be categorized. and they can, You can shove them into two molds, or they demonstrate which mold they've come from. He says, we all want to serve God, right? Those of us who are God's people, we want to serve God. But some Christians' service is of a very different sort than the service of other Christians. And he says, some Christians are like weekend saints. They come to church, they got their Bible, they're all dressed up nice, nice. They got their hats on their heads if they're ladies, and they got their suits on if they're men's. And they're doing everything right. They come to church, they listen to the sermon, they... They, they get their head, you know, it's like that television commercial, the top of the head pops off and in goes the garbage or whatever, and then it pops back. Okay, so they get filled up. They go home and click. It's like they never went. They don't continue in what they heard. They're not doers of the word. They are only hearers. Their service basically is limited to the occasional episode when it, wherever they're around other Christians. On contrast to that kind of Christian's quote-unquote service are the Christians that are living true holy lives. And that is, they don't turn it off when they go home. They continue in it. They are doers of what they've heard. And furthermore, they don't merely come for the show. Throughout the rest of the week, they're busy doing things that people don't even see. They're visiting people in the hospitals. They're visiting people at home, the fatherless and the widows, or the widowers. They're doing the things that people don't ordinarily see. Their service is very different. And furthermore, instead of turning it all off after they leave church and just becoming like everybody else, these people over here in their service for God, it says... They keep themselves unspotted from the world. How much of a, contra a contrast could James have drawn? He says true holiness doesn't means, first of all, handling your problems right, trusting God and doing right. right? Now, a little bit later on, he's talking about your religion. What kind of a religion do you have? Let me ask you that this morning. What kind of religion do I have? Is it a Sunday go to meeting religion which I turn off when I leave and my Christianity really isn't practical? It doesn't really relate to anything else I do. Is it that kind of religion? You know. And usually there are telltale signs that other people can pick up as well. <laughs> they can look at you and and look at your friends, and they look where you go, and they, 
And uh, they look at the way you dress sometimes and the habits you have, and it all, it, it'll come out sooner or later what kind of a religion you have. True holiness, according to James, means you have the type of religion that is continuous and obedient and in which you are personally involved in becoming a clean person. You keep yourself unspotted from the world. Let's go to chapter 2. James has a great deal to say about holiness. Let's start reading from chapter 2, verse 14, and go down to about verse 24 or 25. He's on a different topic in this chapter. What does it profit, my brothers, though a man say he has faith and does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead, being alone. Yeah, a man can say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? You're doing well. The demons also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he, was offered, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and his, by works his faith was made perfect? The scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. There's our theme again imputed unto him for righteousness or holiness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that by works a man is justified. And justified is another reference to holiness, declared righteous, and not by faith only. In like manner also was Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. James' third point in this book on holiness is about how you become holy and how you prove it. The key words here in this chapter are show. What does it profit a person if he has faith and doesn't have works? One of you can say this, but you don't show it. Um, he's in, James is interested in talking about people that show that they are genuinely saved. Someone used the illustration one time this way. If, um, if I can get it out straight. If people were in the business of arresting Christians on the basis of what they did, would there be enough evidence to arrest you The only way that other people really know that you and I have trusted in Jesus Christ is, is through the change that it makes in our lives, by what we do, see? And this, this is precisely what James is talking about. He says, first of all, let's talk about this in case anyone here is a little confused or unsure about how you actually become a holy person in the first place. You don't become a holy person by doing anything. You and I cannot work or climb the ladder, as it were, to becoming some great spiritual giant. It's impossible. God will not accept our works of righteousness. Anything that we naturally do in this life on our own to try to please God, He considers it like garbage. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in His sight. And it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to God's mercy that He saves us. That's Paul and Isaiah, hand in hand teaching that you can't do anything yourself to become a righteous person. You have to, you become a righteous person just the same way Abraham, the most godly, the greatest Jew in the Jewish mind, 
Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation. And then James uses another illustration. Or whether you're a lowly Gentile harlot. Regardless of what kind of a person you are, you get righteousness or holiness the same way. And that is to gift. Paul talks about the gift of righteousness, which is through faith, in Romans chapter 5. Here, in verse 23, James talks about Abraham having righteousness imputed to him. It's like God wrote out a check and said, here you go, you've got righteousness. I consider you to have something you didn't have before. How did Abraham get it? Because one day God gave him a promise. Abraham believed the promise. He believed the promise. And as a result of his belief, God gave him righteousness. James is quoting in the 23rd verse here, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's how Abraham became a holy person. But that wasn't the end. We know Abraham is the father of faith. In his lifetime, and he lived for a number of years, he demonstrated that he really was a believer. How? Well, the most outstanding example that James could put his finger on was the time when Abraham took his only son, according to the instructions of God, took him up to a mountaintop, and was prepared to kill his son according to the precise instructions of God. That proved that Abraham really believed God. That proved it. His works proved that he was a righteous man. J. Sidlow Baxter, an English preacher, says that what James is saying here is that faith justifies the man. In other words, if we have faith, God will make us holy. And works justify the faith. The works demonstrate or prove the validity of our faith. Don't you tell me that you're a Christian and expect me to believe it if you are unprepared to demonstrate your faith in your life. And that's precisely where a lot of Christians are. That's why it's necessary that Christian teachers and preachers and ever, ever since the time of Christ have found it necessary to repeat this sort of teaching on holiness. Because there have always been the, the fakes and the, and the genuine articles in the Christian churches. Holiness means responding in faith and obedience when we have trials. That's James chapter 1. Secondly, holiness means having the kind of religion in which I become a righteous person by practice. Continual, diligent obedience. Thirdly, holiness is something I get from God and I prove it by a changed life. That's James's third point. We're not going to have time. We're already way over time this morning. Let me just leave it at that point, And I'll tell you um, that if you will read chapters 3 through 5, you'll discover that there are three other points about holiness. There are three other things that James has to say about living the holy life. See if you can find them this week. Read through those three chapters. But let me just conclude by going back to our, our starting point. How would you like to have a brother that was perfect? That you are constantly being compared to this kind of a person. In a real sense, every one of us this morning who are God's children, who have been made righteous spiritually by Jesus Christ, we do have a perfect brother. The book of Hebrews describes the Lord Jesus as our brother as the brother of every Christian. We have a family here. God is the Father, and Jesus Christ is our elder brother. And those of us who have put faith in Jesus Christ are considered in the family. We're in the family of God. What I want to leave you with this morning is simply the question, what do you think your brother thinks of you? It's not so much a matter of what do you think of your brother. But what does he think of you? Someday we're going to stand in front of our brother, the Lord Jesus, who is, in his lifetime, demonstrated a perfect, holy life. 
we're going to stand before him and, and we're going to have to answer to him for our failures in not living as his own, as his brothers and sisters in not living up to par because before he left he made it possible for us to uh, to do that he demonstrated himself he lives within us he's here present with us he's given us his spirit what about holy life what kind of a religion do you have how do you respond to trials have you been trying to get holiness by your own deeds or can you say you have trusted in Christ and been given the gift of holiness those are serious issues and I hope that you will uh, think about them in conclusion this morning let's uh, sing is Alice still here to play the piano hmm